my name is Matt Hatul Masri, if you don't know me, and welcome to this meeting. Um, today's speaker from uh, Minneapolis, right? Uh, Minnesota. Not close yep. to Minneapolis, you said. Yes, close. Yep. Close to Minneapolis. Is Robert Berdingheimer. I hope I didn't uh, mangle your name. That's pretty good, Bodigheimer. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, works for Schwann Home Delivery, providing business solutions with web technologies. He's a Microsoft MVP. He told me he's been an MVP for like 15 years. A progress ninja. I think that's a title for people who fiddle and fiddler. <laughs> <laughs> an ASP insider, a plural site author, and a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. Whoa. Robert regularly speaks at national, international, and international events. So his topic today is something that's really important for web developers. And it's Fiddler. It's a tool that's made by Telerik, and it's free. So take it away, uh, Robert. All right, I'm going to stop my video here. Minimize that so you can see everything OK, right? So yes, we're going to talk, I, we gonna talk about screen, yes. Okay. We're going to talk about advanced fiddler techniques. Um, if you want during the talk, feel free to put questions into the chat and we'll pull them up as we have a chance or we can handle them at the end as well. So we went through the bio here, so I won't do too much. So the Progress Ninja is like Microsoft's MVP. So I am the uh, Progress Ninja for Fiddler. So I've been doing Fiddler things for more than a decade. Um, I have my Twitter, my email, and my blog. I do have the slides will be available. I have a link at the end that has a little bit of code, but mostly the slides. So when we're starting to talk about Fiddler, we have to talk about HTTP. So HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol. I listed out the various versions there. Um, 1.1 came out in, I think, 1999, and we've been using that forever. HTTP 2 came out in 2015. Uh, the only note I have on uh, HTTP2, I'm going to talk about various versions or types of Fiddler. Um, the Fiddler Classic, which I'm going to use today for most of the demos, does not support HTTP2 or 3. So just be aware of if you need to troubleshoot those, you should move to Fiddler Everywhere, which we'll talk about. I like having the specs there because I've actually read them. Uh, I've had cases where things are not behaving like they should. I, I would usually refer to the specs. They're pretty readable. They have a lot of good details, and it's not necessarily what every vendor does, but at least specifies what should happen so you know the official rules. Like I said, they're really approachable if you need to read about specific things. HTTP is a request and a response paradigm, which we'll see throughout the talk, and each request and response has a header section and a body section. So what is Fiddler? Uh, that's Eric Lawrence. So Eric was working on uh, Microsoft clip art team. And he realized when people would order clip art and try to download it, they'd have issues and call in for support. And there wasn't a great tool to support people trying to help you or to troubleshoot web problems. So he built a tracing tool specifically for HTTP and HTTPS, which I'll show you. Uh, I'm really impressed with Eric. I met him a year ago. Uh, he did not know HTTP. He did not know .NET. He did not know C Sharp. And he decided to tackle all of those at once and write Fiddler on the side while he was a full-time employee at Microsoft. So I, I just find that amazing. It was acquired by Telerik in 2012. Uh, so it's now owned by Progress. I have two links there. So the main Fiddler link, and like I said, there's two different products now. So Fiddler Everywhere is Progress. They basically scrapped and started over and they wrote a cross-platform version of Fiddler Everywhere. So in the past, it only ran on Windows. Now you can get Windows, Mac, or Linux. That's the cross-platform version. That is a subscription, just so you know. Fiddler Classic is what I've used forever. It's on Windows. I'm going to use that primarily for this talk, mostly because they're adding to Fiddler everywhere. I mean, each release, it gets better and adds on things. But there's still some advanced techniques I'm going to show today that are not in Fiddler everywhere yet. Uh, so that's why I'm going to be showing it in Classic. At the very end, I'll go and show what Fiddler Everywhere looks like. So how does Fiddler work? Uh, Fiddler is a proxy. So what happens is I'm just going to show you a before and after. I'm going to open up my browser. And I'm just going to go into the settings here. And 
if I open up the proxy settings, we can say that there's right now there's no proxy server. So now what will happen is if I go in and open up Fiddler, as soon as I open up Fiddler, it tells Windows that it is available as a proxy. In other words, if you send traffic to me, I can handle HTTP and HTTPS traffic. So if I go back into Edge here, I'm gonna go, let me open this up again. If I go back into sometimes I have to shut that off to see it, so we'll see if it. Do it one more time here. So now that Windows has told it, Edge should pick that up automatically. So all the modern browsers pick up that there's now a proxy in place and say so they will route traffic through that. So if I go in here and we look at the IP address, so if you, I should have wore the shirt tonight. There's no place like 127.0.0.1. That is the IP address for your own machine. So essentially what it's doing is Fiddler started up and it says, I'm gonna run on port 8888 on this local IP address. So now programs that want to use a proxy will start to route their traffic through Fiddler. And so that's how Fiddler actually intercepts traffic. So again, what Fiddler's point is, it's gonna watch traffic between the browser and the server so that we can use it for, at first I'm gonna show just tracing and troubleshooting, but you can actually modify a traffic as well. I'll talk about this a little bit at the end. It becomes important, like I said, all the modern browsers know uh, the proxies that ex exist. They'll ask the system for the proxy settings. So they, they should all pick up that Fiddler is there and running. If you have certain tools, like I'm an ASP.NET developer, I traditionally I run ASP.NET on my development laptop. I will use Fiddler to watch traffic from the browser to my uh, IIS ASP.NET server. But then I'm often making third party calls for HTTP services, REST services, whatever. Those aren't automatically picked up by, by Fiddler. And I'll show later how you can do that. But essentially, .NET code by default is not looking at the proxy config. So if you're ever trying to do traces and you don't see the traffic in Fiddler, you need to focus on are there proxy settings in this client or tool that let it direct traffic to Fiddler. I don't love this term, uh, but this is the term that Eric had chosen. He calls a single request and response within Fiddler as a web session. So I'm gonna show you quickly if you have not seen this before, I'm just gonna pull up a page that I have here. So we'll go to this one. I just have a fictitious travel site here. I'm gonna hit control F5 just to make sure it refreshes. And I can come in and look at these requests and responses. So on the left, I see it, it asked for the home page on port 86. I can see the headers that are sent. So we'll talk about that a bit in the talk. And then we can see at the bottom here, I get some response headers and then I get the actual content. So Eric chose to call each one of those things like the one I've highlighted a web session. I'm an ASP.NET developer. So when I think sessions, I think of the series of requests you're gonna make on my site. So I just wanted to point out uh, in the book documentation and stuff, when you hear about web sessions, that's what that means. So there's a lot that I can do with a web session. We'll look at the marking and commenting first. So. I've been using Fiddler for more than a decade. And when I need to do a trace, I'm often gonna send it to another developer or I might send it to an operations person, a security person, maybe an external vendor. What I might wanna do is come in here and say, see jQuery, I'm just gonna mark that. We'll just choose orange. And I'm just gonna add a comment to that to say that, um, you know, upgrade to latest version. So it's nice that when somebody else opens it, they're gonna immediately, I can say, focus on the one that's orange, they can come in here. If you scroll around, you can see the comment will be included or you can add that count if you want, you can see it here. I've got a little limited real estate here with the resolution I've got going, but it's just nice because I can mark what I'm talking about, put comments in, and it's a lot easier to find things in here. I can also look at properties. So if I want to, I can just look at some specifics about that request. So there's a lot of detail here about uh, how that request was made, how long it took for various parts. So you may want to take a look at that. And then if I go back, I'm trying to close this here with my, there we go. 
The other thing I want to do is I want to be able to search. So this is a pretty simple, that's not a lot of requests going on from my page here. Often on our site or normal sites usually have about 100 requests going back and forth. So sometimes it's hard to figure out why is something happening on my site. So for instance, if I were looking at this trace, I might see this uh, halflings font. And I might say, I don't know why that's being requested. I don't think that I did that personally. So I want to figure out where did that come from? So what I can do is I can just do a search. So I can say, edit, find sessions, and type in halflings. And if I search, you can see it found the one in the URL. So that's pretty obvious. What I was really hoping it would do is I was hoping it would tell me who referenced this, which one of those files is the one that requested that. So an important thing, note on here is this decode compressed content. So I do a lot of web performance talks. You should be using compression on your website because it just makes the files, text files often, you know, anywhere from 50, 75% or 80% smaller by compressing it. The problem is Fiddler by default, when it sees compressed content, it doesn't search into that content. So I need to say decode compressed content. And now if I search again, you can see that it identified Bootstrap. So, and that's what I wanted to know, right? I didn't put that font in myself. Bootstrap included it, and that's where I now found that. Another thing I can do, I'm just going to click here. You can actually now, that's a common enough thing that there's a uh, find the parent. So here I can come and say select parent request. And it's going to go back through similar to the search, but it's going to now pinpoint Bootstrap again and say that's the file that asked it asked for that font. So again, it's really helpful, especially when you have multiple developers, designers, vendors, tagging. When a site gets complex, it's nice to be able to search for things like that. Another cool thing is to search for things that match this session. So I'm just going to try to make my screen here a little better if you can hold on for a second okay and what i want to do now i'm trying to get my header over here if i can slide this over a little again sorry about that but this is what i'm looking for so it's got content types so if I look and I see I, I have a single, say, JPEG file, if I hold down the Alt key and click on any value in a given column, so if I hold the Alt and hit JPEG, it's going to go identify all of the other JPEGs in this uh, set of requests. So that's very handy. Again, when you have 100 requests listed, it's a quick way to say, I want to see all the JavaScript files, or I want to see all the CSS files, or any set for any of those columns, I can do that Alt, and it'll do a similar search. So that's pretty handy. So the next one is decrypting HTTPS. So you should be using your HTTPS for all of your sites today. Um, that's very important. And I just want to talk about a little bit the way HTTPS works. It's just using HTTP over an encrypted channel. So it used to be SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. You'll still hear people use that term when they really mean HTTPS, but SSL has been um, deprecated, if you want to call it that. It's not recommended to ever use SSL due to security flaws. You should be using, um, I need to be PCI compliant because I work on an e-commerce site. We have to use at least TLS 1.2, or we've also now just upgraded and started using TLS 1.3. So when I tell you Fiddler has the ability to intercept traffic, that should concern you. Right. I mean, the whole point of HTTPS is I don't want somebody on the wire to be able to see the conversation between my browser and the server. So when I say that Fiddler can do that, that's that seems very strange. And uh, so I'll show you why it works, why it's safe, how it functions. Fiddler, again, is a proxy. So it's a person in the middle. It's sitting between your browser and the web server. So by default, the, this tracing is not turned on, but I'll show you how to turn it on and again, how that actually functions. So I'll go into tools, options here, HTTPS. So right now I'm not doing any decryption. So I'm just gonna clear this and I'm going to go to, I've got this page hosted on Azure as well that's using HTTPS. So if I go back into Fiddler, this is what you would expect, right? Fiddler can see that there's a tunnel 
used for HTTPS. So it knows that I'm conversing with this site on that port, but I can't see anything. If I came back over here on the right and tried to go into inspectors and stuff, it's not gonna show me anything useful. I can just see that it's doing a connection and it says, in this case, I'm using TLS 1.2, but I can't learn anything about the actual content. What I need to do to do that, I'll go to tools options. I'll go to HTTPS. I'm gonna say decrypt HTTPS traffic. So what it tells me is this is Fiddler's trick. It's sitting between you and the server. So what Fiddler wants to do is it's going to say, I'm going to be a trusted certificate authority. So if you know how HTTPS works, there are trusted certificate authorities like uh, Let's Encrypt is a free one, but basically they are well known uh, and they issue certificates for people. Fiddler is going to say, I'm gonna sit in the middle and anytime you go to a website, I'll intercept that you want to use HTTPS. I'll create a fake certificate for that web server and send it back to you on the client. So then your client thinks it's talking to the real web server, but it's actually using Fiddler certificates. So what it's asking me now, <clears throat> I have to trust Fiddler's root certificate so that it can make up its own certificate. So it's going to ask me a couple questions. I say, yes, I want to trust it. Yes, I really do want to. Yes, I understand what I'm doing. Right now I get this. I'm going to restart the browser. It does not always pick that up immediately. So I'll just go start it again. And if I go back and try to run that page, I'll hit control F5 to make sure we don't have stuff cached. And it falls right in the world. We'll come back here. Oop, I actually got to hit OK. So I'm going to do that again. And again, I'll close this. So make sure it picks up the new decryption. I'm going to hit Control F5. And now you can see what we saw before. Now it's actually intercepting, and I can see all of that traffic. So again, this is only on your own site, and you have told it that you trust it to generate certificates. So if I come in here and I want to see how that actually works, I can go back here. If you've never been in here, there is a uh, certificate manager. And this is Windows, so I'm going to just open that up. And if I go into personal certificates, I can see there's one here for Azure websites. So that's where I'm going. That's where the site is hosted. You can see that Fiddler issued and signed a certificate that looks like it's that web server. Because I said I trusted it, any certificates that Fiddler makes like that, my browser will say they're good. It's like it's the server. So then when Fiddler gets all of these requests, what it's going to do is it's going to give out a fake certificate. It can then decrypt because it knows the right certificate. It goes out to the actual web server, gets the real certificate, and then re-encrypts it up while it goes over the internet. So it's still safely encrypted while it's on the internet. But here, just on my machine, I'm actually able to go in and do troubleshooting just like I did before. So I've used Fiddler forever. You know, I got used to troubleshooting and then suddenly HTTPS came out, everything was secure and I couldn't see anything. So it was great when this feature was added that now I can troubleshoot just like I did before uh, by taking advantage of that feature. Next thing we'll look at is filters. And there's just an easy way to do some various stuff that I'll show you on there. And then we'll talk about this troubleshooting filters. So if I go to the filters tab, I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. If I go to the filters tab, we'll look at some of the functions that are available. <clears throat> I can actually filter to only see traffic from intranet or internet, or I can say I only wanna see stuff from a certain host. So I could go type in here, you know, I only wanna see bing.com or whatever. So it's a way to limit, uh, if you've done this before, when you turn Fiddler on, you're gonna see lots of traffic. There are a lot of things on your computer talking in the background that you don't even know are making requests out to other places. And sometimes it's hard then to troubleshoot because you have all that additional stuff. I can also come in and say, I only want to see traffic from a specific process. So if I knew that I had MS Edge here, you can see I've got a couple instances of Edge. If I said, I only want to see traffic from this specific process, I could do that. Couple other things that are cool. So, so far we've been talking about tracing, uh, you know, Fiddler DevTools has caught up to um, being able to view stuff. You can go see the requests in DevTools. 
Fiddler is going to let me do a lot more things because it's sitting between the browser and the server. Again, it can actually modify things on the fly. So I'm just going to clear this up a little. We talked about compression earlier. And so what I'm going to do, if you've seen compression before, what it does, I'm going to just re-request this again. If we come in here, we look at this bootstrap.min. So by default, when it makes a request, the browser will tell the server that it understands compression. So if I look up here, one of these headers is called accept encoding. What I just told it to do in Fiddler, normally it would say accept encoding, gzip, and deflate, and all these other things. I basically told Fiddler that I don't want that to happen. Instead, I want you to delete that request header. So now what I've done is, even though the browser wanted to send and say it could handle compressions, I'll show it again here. I'll take that off, and we'll just rerun that request. When it's not there, <clears throat> if we look at things like Bootstrap, not compressed, it's 160K. Compressed, it's about 37K. So again, when I turn this on, I'm saying, hey, Fiddler, you're sitting between browser and server. Please just pull off that request header, because I want to see what the server or the client might do differently if I modify that request. So that's kind of a nice feature. I can set request headers if I want to. I'm gonna show you breakpoints in a little while, so I'll skip that part for now. Um, I can hide authentication demands. So if you do a lot of work where you see 401s and that kind of stuff, if you don't wanna see any of these specific statuses, you can just ask them to hide it. You can also do a time heat map. So it's hard coded in the Fiddler. I think if it's less than 50 milliseconds, it'll be green. It just color codes each one of these requests based on whether it considered it to be a fast response all the way down to a slow, it would be a red response. Another cool thing is you can block files. So if I wanna see what would happen if I did, if I block my CSS files and went back to this and did a control F5, not terribly surprising, right? It looks really bad because none of my styles were applied. Another performance tweak that people do these days is they do what's called inlining critical CSS. So they split their CSS so that it shows specifically just what's above the fold. So if I did it again, they'd get the minimum amount of styles in a style sheet to be able to look so that this up here is at least decent looking. They then inline that, they put it directly into the actual HTML response because your browser then does not have to wait to download a CSS file before it can start to show things. It's a, it's a good performance technique. If I wanna see if I did it right, that's where Fiddler is interesting. I can come in there again and say, I want to block CSS files. If I did my inlining correctly, I should see a basic, you know, the basic styles to show this should still be there if I did my critical correctly. So this is an example of a practical use of why I might want to do that. I can also do down here the response headers. I can actually flag um, responses with certain headers. I can delete response headers. If I want to mark some of these that have cookies, I can do that. So if you're GDPR and you need to make sure that all the vendors on your site, you need to know which ones set cookies, I can just turn that on and request again. And it'll put all of these individual sessions that set a cookie will be in italics. So it's a quick way for me to spot check who is all setting cookies on my site. Again, if you're on a realistic site, you've got third-party vendors and stuff, you wanna know that you know who you use and if they set cookies or not. So that's kind of helpful. That's filters. Uh, there's a lot more power we're gonna get into. These are just quick headers to do some of the basic things that you might want to do. The last thing noted on here, um, Eric used to get calls quite a bit where people would say, I was tracing traffic and now I don't see any traffic anymore. And the problem was because they were filtering things out and they forgot they were filtering. So he added this troubleshoot. What it will do is it'll show everything that was hidden, but have a strike through th for it. So he said that really cut down the calls of people talking to him because they realized that it's their filters they set up that are not allowing them to see some stuff. So that's what that is there for. Next, we'll talk about Composer. So Composer is really, the concept is how Fiddler got its name. You can fiddle with requests. You can create them manually. Uh, you can do a drag and drop. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on this first part first, and I'll just show you how we wanna do this. 
So I'm gonna go back and request the page again. Now what I can do is I can say, I want to take that request for bootstrap. I wanna drag it over here because I wanna change something on it. And just to use the same theme we were looking at before, I'll, I'll do this. I'm gonna take off the accept encoding. So I can literally modify this request in any way that I want and hit execute. And if you can see now, because it wasn't compressed, because it didn't have that header, you can see that it's a lot larger now. So you can create this by hand. So if you're doing testing and you need to do very specific things, you could do that. I generally will pull over a full request and then modify things I wanna modify. And this comes in very handy because I do security testing as well. And somebody says, if you do this you know, weird thing, you're gonna see a problem. It's not always easy to make a browser do some things. Like you can't just go in your browser and say, don't do compression today. But I can put anything I want. This is literally just the request because that's all the web server ever sees, right? It's just, it's a request that looks like this. It's a get with a bunch of headers. That's all that it is. So this allows you to make a modification. So I'm gonna show you a practical use of this. So I have this page it lets me, I could order this really modern looking, not so much um, tablet convertible uh, and it's $1,095 each. So if I come over here, I can see the request. I could drag it over here and drop it. And if I look at this, I'm gonna actually go over here and do a post. Sorry, I'll do a check out one of those. I'm gonna drag that one over. You'll notice something weird. So here's the headers of the post. It's a post to my server here. Uh, the body of it has the cost right in it, right? Well, that's odd. I'm gonna give myself a discount and try to do that for a dollar, right? If the server side programmer is doing things correctly, it should not be taking prices from a client post because you, if you're familiar with security and all of that sort of stuff, it, it's a hostile environment on the web. You can't trust things that are sent from clients. So this would be a perfect example of, you better not be pulling the price off what the client said. So if I hit execute and I go back here, I'm just gonna go up to inspectors. This has compression, so I'm just gonna take that off. And if I go look at this and I roll down a little bit, I'll actually pop it up in notepad so we can see it a little better. I ordered one Acer convertible and the order I'm gonna cost me a dollar each. Oops, right? And again, this wouldn't be easy necessarily to simulate but I can tweak anything I want. And now I've proven that the server side validation, basically they're not validating things. They're actually pulling the price from what gets posted, which would be a very big problem. You're not gonna be in business very long if you sell tablets for a buck. The next one is executing curl commands. So if you've heard of curl commands before, they're just simple ways to make web requests. I get people will audit our website and say, here, I found a security flaw. Security people especially love having curl commands. So they gave me a curl command. My problem was I'm on Windows. I don't have a trusted curl client. So when I stumbled across this in Fiddler, I was pretty excited about it. If I go into my uh, composer again, but there it is. I can actually say, I wanna do a scratch pad. This is curl. So I can go right here and say curl, just ask for bing.com and execute it. And then we'll see down here, for some reason that failed, it didn't like something in here, but I can execute all of those specific requests. And then it would make a request out to the server. So I don't know why that is not cooperating right now, but if you need to do curl things, just be where it's built in. So it was the first time I had a trusted client like Fiddler where I could make those kind of requests. That's all cool, um, but I wanna be able to do breakpoints. And so what I wanna do is when the browser sends something to the server, I'd like to intercept it on the fly so that I could make modifications to it. I'm gonna come back to this later, but at the bottom here, it's called the quick exec section. I'm just gonna say BPU bootstrap min.css. So I'm gonna hit enter. So what I've instructed Fiddler is if you ever see now a request for that bootstrap min file, I want you to pause. I want, it came from the browser, but before you send it to the server, wait until I modify and play with it. So I'm gonna do this. I'll go back to here. I'll hit control F5. Probably can't see it, it's kind of subtle, but this is glowing now. 
And if I look, it's sitting on that bootstrap min CSS and it's waiting. So essentially the browser sent it, but it has not been passed on to the server yet. So if I come into the inspectors, this is the request. I can just come and do the modification again. So I'm, I'm sticking with that theme so that we see the same thing. I modified the headers that came up from the browser before it actually goes to the web server. And I'm gonna say run to completion. And now when this finishes, you should end up seeing that Bootstrap here is going to come in and it'll be the uncompressed version again. So that's very powerful. So now you saw some things you could do with filters. You could take off certain headers. There is Composer, that's handy, handy as well. Uh, but sometimes setting a breakpoint is exactly what you wanna do so that you can get in between. So I'm gonna type BPU that turns that breakpoint off. So that one was on the way from the client to the web server. If I do BP after, what it's gonna do is it sent the request to the server. <clears throat> when it came back, I'm going to get a breakpoint again. So I set that one on site.css. I'm gonna just do this again. I hit control F5. I go in and do my, I actually gotta find one here. That's apparently not my right one. Do that again. Okay, so you can see now it's sitting and waiting on site.css. So again, I can come over here, take off the compression. I can kind of play around here and look for something I might wanna change. So if I wanna tweak the CSS in any way, so I'm just gonna change this color to be purple. I should do Chuck Norris, that's actually a CSS color. I'll do purple for now. If I say run to completion, so that what happened there again, it went from the browser to Fiddler, up to the web server. When it came back, it let me modify it on the fly and you can see it did the modification. So this is really handy when I need to just tweak something that's on a, say a production server. I don't wanna go deploy everything. I just wanna be able to get in between and make some changes. So side note on this, um, performance, we were doing uh, buffer or uh, minifying and bundling all of our CSS files. So we took all of our CSS files and put them into one CSS in HTTP 1.1 that helped performance. The issue was that it worked fine for about a month. I added some more styles, it failed. I couldn't figure out why, so I did a breakpoint like that. I just said, I'm gonna make requests to the server and I'm just gonna change the CSS and see what I can find. And it turned out there's a rule in IE that you can't have more than 4,096 unique styles per style sheet. So we had just crossed that value. So IE didn't work, everybody else did. I wouldn't have found it very quickly unless I was able to just go in and make tweaks like that without having to do a full build, compile and move for the deployment, if that makes sense. I'm gonna turn off, I gotta go turn that off again in Fiddler so that I don't stop all the time. So BP after, I'm just gonna hit enter. Now that's turned off for that file. So again, you can do it on any specific files you want. Next one that's cool is autoresponder. So because again, Fiddler's a proxy, it can return information without actually talking to the web server. And there's a bunch of stuff about rules here. I'll show you an unmatched request pass through. I just wanna show you what the behavior will be like. So I'm gonna clear this again. All right. So I'm gonna make this request. We'll just do this one again. This will work fine. So I'm gonna take that bootstrap man. I'm gonna drag it over to the auto responder here and I'm gonna drop it. And what I can do now is it says, if you ever see a request for that exact URL, I want you to do something different. So in this case, I say, I want you to delay. This is in milliseconds. So I'm gonna delay it. This will be a total of 15 seconds. Now I can come back here, hit control F5. I want to see if I'm pulling my CSS file off of a CDN or a vendor or whatever, what would happen if that thing was slow? And you can see what would happen. My customer sees nothing waiting for that CSS file. So again, the critical CSS technique might be a good idea there. Uh, but again, it's not easy to simulate. You can go into DevTools and say, act like I'm a slow connection, but that's every request. This I can target specific requests. And I can also say, well, what happens if I get a 404? what happens if I return different content? So let me do this one. This is the homepage. I'm gonna say unlock for editing. I'm gonna go over to the inspectors. 
And if I look at the HTML, you can see the title is Sydney. I'm just gonna add on the end of that Robert just for fun. And if I come back here and say, take that off, what's happened now is Fiddler's looking for the request for that home page. It's going to instead modify it on the fly. And if all works as I hope it does, oops, sorry, I still have my still have my slowness turned on here. We don't want that for the rest of the demo. Hit control of five again. And why are you not making my change here? I'll try that one more time here. I'm gonna unlock for editing. You can save this actually to the disk. So you can actually go and make a complete change to how this thing runs and store the file on your disk. So I've heard of people saying, I have to do a really important demo and I wanna make sure that it works. You can actually save off all the CSS, JavaScript, your whole site as it would come back from the server locally. And then you can set up auto responder rules to catch and intercept so it never actually has to talk to. Why are you not behaving today? I was trying to get the dash Robert here. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. I'll pause on that one. But the idea again is if I did, if I wanted to, I can come here and say, I wanna save this. We'll try it that way. Maybe that'll work a little better. I'm just gonna save the response. I'm gonna do the response body and I'll just store it on my desktop here and, and I'll leave that name, that's fine. So let's go modify that file. So, oops, sorry, that was still compressed. You're getting to see all the things you're gonna have to remember. So I wanna decompress that before I actually do a save. Do that again. So now I'm gonna just open this up. I'll make a modification to it again. Let's add in the dash Robert. Let's save that. Now when I go back in here, what I can do is I can drag it over and put in an autoresponder. So when you make a request for that, I want it to instead pull up a file. So I'm gonna pull that one off the desktop. I'll save that rule. If I go back here, let's hope this one works. There you go, you can see it here. Where this is helpful, so we have a lot of designers and CSS people that are doing things for our site. Uh, one of them happened to be wanting to make changes. He, he thought he knew how to fix a bug in production, but again, he'd have to give it to me. I'd have to do a build, I'd have to move it somewhere. I don't wanna just move it to production to do a specific test for him. I said, why don't you just set up that response store the CSS on your own machine. Now you, he could just tweak that CSS file all he wanted, make all the changes he's hoping to do. Then when he runs Fiddler like that on his client, he'll get that different CSS applied to what, wherever he's pointed, production stage, it doesn't matter. So it was a good way to troubleshoot by cutting down that uh, cycle of having to get built by being able to just store files and do an autoresponder like that. So that is autoresponder. So I've been using Fiddler forever. Things were going great. I could start looking at HTTPS uh, responses. Then mobile hit, right? People started coming and using phones and stuff. Well, I can run Fiddler on my, I can run Fiddler Classic on my Windows machine, but how do I trace a phone? So we're gonna look at, uh, we talked about proxies before. So I'm just gonna show you what I did on a phone, in this case on iOS, the settings for proxy is not where you would expect it to be. It turns out on iOS, you have to go into the uh, Wi-Fi settings. And if you go down to HTTP proxy, you can manually, so I went on my Windows machine here, I ran IP config and I found out that was my IP address. Then I went on my Apple and these devices have to be on the same network, right? So on my example, I'm at home, they're both on the same network. You can go on the phone then and say, please route your traffic to that IP address and the standard Fiddler port. Now I'm routing all the traffic from that phone is coming through Fiddler so I can do everything we just talked about. So on my phone then, iPhone, it would do that. I'd be able to see a trace. And if I went into the actual trace file, uh, you can save off Fiddlers. I haven't shown this yet, but I mean, you can save off the whole um, session with all the web sessions and such. But if I come in here and look, if I pull up the inspectors and I look at the header, you can see right there, it says it's an iPhone. 
So that's very powerful. So now I'm able to route other devices through my Windows machine and then still do everything I wanted to do with Fiddler breakpoints. It doesn't matter, but it was the first time I could actually do good traces from Android devices, iOS phones, tablets, all that kind of stuff. Some common issues I want to mention. So if we go back into Fiddler here, usually I will go get a trace. I'm going to hit Control F5. As soon as I get the trace I want, I turn off capturing here. Because like I said, if you run it on your own machine, there might be a lot of other stuff on your machine making requests that are going to fill up your trace and make it harder to see. So when I turn that off, I've done this before. I'll forget that I shut off capturing. I'll come in, I'll go in my browser again, and I'm just gonna hit Control F5. I go over to Fiddler and I'm like, where's all my traffic? It's not being caught, it's because I shut that off. So if you're aware, make sure that you check that. The other thing that you can do is, if you see this any process, <clears throat> I can click and drag that and I can drop it on a specific instance of a browser. And what it'll do then is it'll say the process name up here. So similar to when you saw filters, that says I'm only going to watch traffic now from that specific instance. And it's not uncommon that, that people do that. Then they close the browser, open up a new one. That's a different process, but they forgot to take this back off. So if it is doing a process, you can click here and it'll just say any process again. But that makes it uh, start to trace again. So just be aware that might be why you're not seeing some of the stuff you want to see traced. I talked about .NET. Um, .NET classes by default don't go through proxies. So you can set that in .NET. If you go into your application's config file, you can set up a default proxy. And here I'm just saying, if anytime you're gonna do HTTP related stuff, please use the proxy address. We saw that before. That's just this machine on that port. Now, when it comes to the browser to ASP.NET, I could always see that with Fitter. Now when the ASP.NET pages are making HTTPS calls out to the internet or whatever, those will also get picked up by Fiddler. So again, if you modern browsers understand this, they know how to use a proxy. If you're using a client and you're not seeing traffic, you need to be able to investigate how on that client am I supposed to set a proxy address. So, so the next one, everything we talked about is cool, but it'd be really cool if I could have Fiddler actually uh, run some code where I could do things. So I'm going to show you how to do that. There's some common functions I might want to intercept. So I'm going to go back into Fiddler here. And I'm going to say customize rules. This is going to open up an editor. And I'll just show you an example here. I'm going to find, OK, so down here, there's an event that gets fired. So in this case, it is on before request. So when the browser sends to the server before it gets sent to the server, I want to intercept it. So here I'm programmatically making changes. So I could pull off that header we've been talking about. In this case, I'm just going to say if you, if the URL ends in .jpg, I want to show the session highlighted in yellow. So I'm going to hit Control F5. If I go back now, I can see all the JPEGs are in yellow. So not a great thing I would actually do because I can't even read that. Um, what I have done with it before is we use a lot of vendors for our website. And every vendor you talk to says, oh, you can include our JavaScript. It'll never affect your site, right? If we're slow, what if it goes wrong, uh, it, it'll be fine. Just put it in the head and, and go move on. What I like to do then is I come in here and I actually write code so I can just say, if I see, so I gotta see if I have an example in here anywhere. So if it's my host name or my CDN, change the colors. If it's anybody else, make it fail. So I'm saying, Everybody that's not my primary web server or my CDN should get back a 404. And I've done this. It's a wonderful test to run to make sure that you have your site coded in a way that none of your third party partners can bring down your site, make it slow. When you do this, suddenly your page doesn't quite work. Then you can start to pinpoint and try to figure out which one of the vendors I'm using is causing me a single point of failure. Or again, here I could do a delay instead of a 404 and just make it actually, um, I'm gonna save those changes to, it's a great way for me to see that I'm not actually impacted by third-party problems 
by doing that and I can do it programmatically. So again, there's a lot of power coming with that ability to programmatically do things. There's a non-exec action one, so I'll show you that. So I customized, so I'm gonna just do a clear here. I actually customized, so I'm just gonna go out to, see, where do I wanna go? I'll go to Bang, well, I'll go to, I'll go to Fiddler here. If I came in here and said, I, I want to maybe not see, oh, I don't know. For fun, I'll just do Telerik. I can say remove host, www.telerik. If I hit enter, you can see that it made it go away. So I actually did that using Fiddler script. So there's a, whatever they type down here, I basically extended Fiddler to say, when you see RH down there, I pulled off that host name and then I went through and hit all the ones that had that host. So again, just programmatic ability is pretty amazing to make modifications. There are cool extensions uh, for Fiddler Classic. I'm gonna focus on, uh, I'll mention the JavaScript formatter. So let me clear this. Again, for performance, I want to do minified files. So if I come in here, you can see that one of these, I'm gonna turn off my, I have this minified bootstrap and JavaScript files. I wanna see those. If you go into DevTools, there's a way to make individual files like that be unminified, if that's a word. So if I came into my network requests or my sources, I can actually go down here and do a pretty print and it will unminify. It doesn't undo everything. Source maps are a better way to do that. But if I just wanna be able to do some basic stepping through, I could do that. I could also get this extension that says make JavaScript pretty. And then by default, I'm gonna re-request this again. Because Fiddler is sitting in between, every time it sees a minified JavaScript file, it's going to actually unminify it. So it says, hey, these were minified, but if I click on them now and look, you'll see that I now can step through and troubleshoot. So back in DevTools in the browser, I'm stepping through normal looking code, not minified code. So that's kind of a cool extension. Another one I like is called Show Image Bloat. So let me go back. I'll see if it's this one. I'm just hitting Control F5 here. I'm trying to see if I have any of these that have image bloat. So I'm gonna have to go pull up one of my other examples here. Bear with me for a moment. This. So you can see I've got images here. Images have metadata by default. So you take a picture with your phone, it could put your lat long in. Uh, it will put in like here, you did this on an iPhone. Here's the day, here's the shutter speed, all that kind of stuff that doesn't help uh, visual quality. It's just embedded as metadata in the image. So what this show image bloat does, it just is pointing out to me that there is metadata in that image file. 15% of the bytes in that file are wasted metadata. So I use JPEG Tran. There's lots of tools that do this, but it strips the metadata out. It won't affect your image quality, but it will make it smaller. And it's funny, if you follow Eric on Twitter, occasionally he'll just post on a random day, a picture that has like 80% bricks on it and he doesn't say anything. That's He just posts that. And then I know that he's out playing with the site and found that it had a huge amount of metadata. So it's a nice way to just spot check if I go back to my other example here. I can quickly go through this and say, hey, great. I don't have any metadata. There's no bricks showing up, okay? Uh, I'll mention Fiddler Cap. So I have marketing people that sometimes need to troubleshoot things on the site. Like they say, hey, this isn't working. Um, what can I do about it? Fiddler Cap is a very simple tool for non-technical people. So I can say, please install this. Then it comes up and they can say, I want to start a capture. They can decrypt HTTPS traffic. I can tell them, clear your cookies, clear your cache. These are much easier to do in here than trying to tell them how to do that all in their browser. They hit start capture. It's going to open a browser. They can go around and do their stuff. Then come back then and say, stop capture and save it. Then they can mail me that. I'll open it in full Fiddler. It'll look in Fiddler just like they actually use Fiddler, but they didn't. They didn't have to go through and try to figure out how that works. So if you have non-technical people, that's a cool thing. 
Another cool feature is they can do a snapshot. I'm sure it's never happened to you, but I have people who say that the page didn't look right. And you say, well, what didn't, I, I don't remember. It just didn't look right. If they hit snapshot, it will actually take a screenshot at that point and embed it into the capture. So when I get the capture, I won't, I can see what they saw, which is really helpful for debugging. Again, for non-technical people, I think that's a, a great way to go. So there's some miscellaneous things. I showed you how you can save off files. So if you, you know, I'm on the internet, I can't find where the official company logo is, but it's on the, the main page for our corporate site. I can just open up in Fiddler and, and right click like you saw me do before and say, I wanna save off that response, which is handy. They also have in Fiddler a way to do a snapshot. So if I make a request, I can just go up here to the camera and I'll hit that and I'll get a, you can see it does a countdown. I would flip over here quick to show my page and it does a simulated like, hey, I just took a picture. Now I can come back and that gets embedded in the capture as well. So now I can see exactly what was going on in that particular uh, screen at that time. So that's handy. You can encrypt the session file. So when you save off, um, I would like this to be default, but it's not, but you can do it. If you say save all sessions, right here you can say, I wanna do a protected. And it's actually using AES 128-bit uh, encryption. You can configure it to two, do 256, so it's serious encryption. It's not weak encryption. So what I can do is I can say that, I can give it a file name, it'll prompt me to say, put in a passphrase, then I'll send this. Now I can send this to vendors and other people over the internet, knowing that people are not intercepting because there can be sensitive things in this trace, especially if you're doing decrypt HTTPS, you might have credit card numbers, you might have login credentials. So when you send that and you're concerned about it being read, encrypt it, and then obviously don't put your password or passphrase in the same email. You could call the person and say, here's the passphrase um, so that they know how to decrypt that on their end. There's a text wizard. So I just started doing uh, capture the flag contests not that long ago. And it's very handy. There, there's a lot of conversions that go on like um, HTML, encoding, base64 encoding, it computes some hashes. So it's cool, you can just pop in here and say, what's the SHA-256 hash of that? And we can see that it's this. So it just comes in handy to do some common conversions you might wanna do as a developer. There's Fiddler Core. So years ago, Eric refactored and pulled the I guess you call the plumbing code of Fiddler, the stuff that does the actual tracing and stuff and put it into Fiddler core so that you could write a .NET app and embed the Fiddler captures and all that stuff into your own app. So if you have a need for that, just be aware it's out there. I showed you the quick exec. I'll show that again. So I'm gonna go back and I'm just gonna hit control F5. If you like command line things, there's a whole heap of things you can do down here in this quick exec. Like I wanna see all the requests that were greater than 50,000 bytes, and it shows me those. I can do uh, select CSS files, and it marks all the CSS files. So there's a whole bunch of stuff down here. CLS will clear the screen. So if you like doing command line stuff, just be aware there's a lot built in. And again, you can use Fiddler's Grip and extend that yourself. Next one is host remapping. So I'm gonna give you a, Eric wrote a book on Fiddler Classic and uh, I've read it, I don't know, 10 or 15 times. And every time I read it, I find something that's like, I didn't know you could do that. Well, this is one of those features that he said, you can remap where things point. So I'm gonna show you what I mean. I'm gonna go out to example.com. So this is what the website looks like. You can actually go in here and say, I want to, anytime you see example.com, route it to this website. So that's just the website here on my machine. So if I hit control F5, you can see now it thinks it's on example.com, but this is the site we've been using all night. And I thought, well, that's cool, but where would I ever use that? Well, we had a production problem and I was trying to troubleshoot it and it was in some vendor uh, JavaScript, but that JavaScript looked and said, you have to be on our production site or it wouldn't run. So I said, well, that stinks because I want to troubleshoot, go into Visual Studio, do debugging on my own machine. 
So I set up a host mapping. I put my production URL into that mapping inside of Fiddler, but I had it point to my local development machine. So it tricks out the browser to think it's in production. It thinks the URL is www.example.com. So my JavaScript, any of that, it, it thinks that's where I am, but it's actually pointed somewhere else. So again, it was a feature that I thought, why would I ever need that? And then it was exactly what I needed. It was the only way I could really troubleshoot what was wrong with that vendors thing without having to put it out in prod, which would be a bad idea. So that's Fiddler Classic. Um, there is now Fiddler Everywhere has version 4.1. I'm gonna just gonna mention some of the advantages. So again, Fiddler Everywhere is cross-platform. So it runs on a Linux and a Mac for the first time. It also has a improved UI. So they just changed a lot of how the user interface looks. I'm used to classic, but there are a lot of nooks and crannies in here that people don't know where these features are. They tried to do in Fiddler everywhere, make that stuff just more apparent. They also have collaboration features. So it's easy for you to be able to save a trace and share it via the cloud with other developers and such. And they have HTTP2 support, which if you're doing HTTP2, that's critical because again, Classic doesn't support HTTP2. There are some missing features. So the stuff I showed you today around the extensions like image bloat, the Fiddler script to be able to programmatically do things, breakpoints, quick exec, those advanced features are just slowly making their way over to Fiddler everywhere. So essentially Fiddler Classic is set in stone now. That is what it is. It's going to stay that way. They're not investing engineering into that. They're putting all their time and effort into Fiddler everywhere. And I, we just hope that some of these specific features will be added. So I'm going to open up Fiddler everywhere. Again, this is a subscription model. So it's going to know that I'm logged in and everything. It runs on a different port, but it's going to be, I'm going to hit control F5 here. Actually, I want to go back and run my own page. Hit Control F5. So again, this is very similar. Here are the sessions. So I can go look at individual requests. I can do Composer. So if I do the same thing here with Bootstrap, if I just say, edit this in Composer, and over in Composer, I can just say, I want to turn off, I want to drop that accept encoding again then I could re-execute it, same thing. It'll come back not compressed. So there's mappings that go over here for all, most of the things that we talked about earlier. So if I, again, if I go over here, the way I stop capturing in classic, I hit a little obscure thing on the bottom here, I can just say stop capturing. And again, I can also use the auto responders now called rules. So I could again, drag over the bootstrap CSS. I'll just say add a new rule and come in here and edit that. So I'm gonna change this again to be, I just want it to be delayed. So again, I'll do 15,000 milliseconds. Go back and do control F5. And then here I can do things like save off requests. So if I have a request that I wanna use periodically, oh, I'm sorry. I got to do one other thing. I didn't have rules turned on here. I was trying to figure out why my thing wasn't slow. Now you can see it clocking because I needed to, I made a rule, but I didn't have rules turned on. Here I can look at inspectors again. Uh, so what I was getting at on the left side here, I can save off requests. So if I did a composer that had a specific, like take this header out, I could actually save that over here and be able to just re-execute. Um, is a, a nice way to be able to rerun things that I might commonly run. And I can also stare, uh, share off sessions over here if I want to get back to previous sessions. And again, there's collaboration. I, I don't have time to go into all of this detail. I just want you to know that it's here. And it's specifically targeted at the cross-platform and people who are new to Fiddler. Uh, so you may want to check this out. Um, see if it works for you. And with that, I have a couple of Pluralsight courses on Fiddler Classic again. Uh, this one is my most recent. Your site doesn't work. How should you figure out what's wrong? Like styles don't work. Should you use DevTools? Should you use Fiddler? Can you use both? What's the appropriate tool to find out what's wrong? This one is just specifically Fiddler Classic. 
Um, how do you write extensions like that image bloat? Uh, how do you write custom inspectors? It goes into a lot of the stuff we talked about today, but it's two hours long or so. Here's the book I was referring to uh, that Eric wrote, second edition. Again, if you're going to use Fiddler Classic, it's really useful to know. It has a lot of just useful information about HTTP, HTTPS, all that kind of stuff. But specifically, if you're using Classic, it gets into all those features. Again, there's Fiddler Everywhere. So I've also done some videos for Fiddler Everywhere. So if we come out to here, we can see that I've got various things like how do you do tracing on a device? You know, how do you do troubleshooting on a device? How do you do performance evaluation? So you can come out here and these are free videos that are just targeting specific areas in Fiddler Everywhere. That's my Twitter. That's my email. That's my blog. That's the link there for the code so that you can get the slides and all the code for this. And if we'd like, we can pop in some questions here. I'm gonna open up the chat and see if there's anything in particular. Could we use a .NET class library when we customize? So that's a good question. I've, so it's funny what he named it. He was working at Microsoft at the time, so he called it jscript.net. So it's kind of a merge, the rule feature in Classic is kind of a merge between JavaScript and there are .NET sort of things in there. I have not specifically tried to drop a specific .NET class in for rules and be able to hook it and see if it works. So that's a good question. I don't know that. Um, that would be an example, if you can do a lot of that, that you might look at Fiddler Core so that you'd leave your app pretty much as it is, but the Fiddler stuff for tracing and stuff, you can embed directly in there. Recently affected by, okay, so this is, if everybody else in Vancouver can check out that one, just looking for a job. Are there any other specific questions that people had? Go ahead and write the questions in the chat if you have any questions. There were some kudos to you, uh, Robert. Amazing, you. such a versatile product and a great presentation as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. the feedback. Kudos to you. Yeah, as a speaker, I do a lot of speaking and you really don't get a lot of feedback, especially it's even harder on virtual because in, in the room, you can see people's faces. And so, yeah, I appreciate any feedback like that. Thank you. Yeah. Like I said, if you come up with something later, feel to uh, reach out to me on Twitter or email and I can look those kind of things up if you think of something later. I'm sure for a lot of people, they're really impressed by what you can do with Fiddler. Yeah, it's, the reason I like this talk is, you know, like I said, I've been using it forever. So when I first used it, I would do a talk and I'd say, how many people use Fiddler? And maybe like two people in the room of 100 or so would say they'd use it. Over the years, that's almost flipped where like 90% of the people have used it. And then I say, I show them something they're like, I never knew it did that. You know, they typically use it for standard tracing. Uh, where a lot of the power comes in is being able to do those modifications and make things fail. All those sorts of things are um, what are really useful that unless you did like I did and read his book 15 times before you understood all the stuff in there. Um, it's just nice to see it where you say like that host mapping. I just I had no idea why I need it. And then one day I'm like, ah, oh, this is exactly going to help me. And it solved my problem in half hour instead of days. So. This is originally a Windows product, I, I, I see. And yep. uh, as you said, the guy was working for Microsoft. Yep. Is there any competitor out there? Uh, there are. So um, if you're into, like I said, I did capture the flag. If you're really immersed in security, mm -hmm. uh, Burp Suite is a proxy that also hooks into a lot of hacking tools and such. Um, so if you do a lot of security, I know that's very popular with that group. Uh, there's a product called Charles Proxy I've heard of. I haven't used it. Um, obviously, DevTools. So DevTools you know, has been getting better over the years. If all you need to do is a trace and be able to see responses and request headers and all that kind of stuff, DevTools are very helpful for that. 
Um, but I have not strayed from Fiddler over the years just because it's always kind of been ahead of what I needed it to do, right? I never found something where I was like, oh, I can't trace a phone. How would I do that? And I find out, well, this is how you do it, point the proxy, um, things like that. Or when he added in decrypting, HTTPS was just in time for me because we were just starting to use it and needed to be able to troubleshoot. So, but those are some of the products that I know of that do those sort of things. My first uh, uh, experience with the Fiddler was almost a decade ago, and I, I used it for a short while. But then when the developer tools and browsers started getting good, I sort of, you know, abandoned Fiddler yep. because most of my interest was really some basic things that I did with the with browser web web apps and so on. Right. So yeah, yeah certainly. Of course, it does way more. Yeah, so certainly like the the one plural site course I have gets into I'll back up here for a second, gets into um, you know I want to step through JavaScript. You know you're not going to do that in Fiddler. You want Dev Tools for that, or I want to tweak styles. Well, that one kind of you could do in either place, right? You could play with the yeah. styles in Dev Tools, but you can also switch it and capture it with Fiddler so that you can. I find it most useful, especially when I need to do something on my prod servers, but I don't want to deploy something. That's where I can play with the files and serve them off my own machine. Um, but yeah, I mean, DevTools gets better all the time and there's certainly things that you'd use it for. And if you're just seeing, if you got a 404 response for a file, use the network tab in DevTools, right? It's built in. It'll find those simple things easily. Uh, to me, the power is all these other modification features and making things slow and fail and all that kind of stuff is what I really look forward to it being. So I saw another question in here. Uh, the Postman, any plans to introduce Postman features in the Composer? So I've used Postman just a little, so I don't have any specific details on. I know they just, um, if you follow the Fiddler everywhere, they're adding stuff literally monthly and they have a new, I think it's soon, they're doing another discussion of all the new features that are coming and there's feedback forms to ask for things. I don't know that I, what specific feature and do I know if that's coming or not? Um, I don't at the moment, because again, I, I just don't use Postman that much. Um, the other one here was interested to try sending Fiddler logs to Elk. So I'm not familiar with Elk. One thing I will say, just be, as we were talking about it, you can in DevTools, you can do a network trace. You can save that off in a file format, but then import it into Fiddler, just so you know. So if you, if you have somebody and you don't want to install something on their computer, but you want to get a network trace, you can trace it in DevTools, save it, and then import it into Fiddler. Yes, I'm not quite sure what that is getting at. So like I said, that is all that I have. So if there's any specific questions I didn't answer that you want to follow up, feel free to send to me there. Appreciate being able to present and meeting everybody this evening. I'm glad people found this useful. And thank you very much, Robert.